Um, hello, uh, my name is Mark Browers. I'm a final year PhD student at the University of Cambridge, and I'll be talking about the process of um, how white dwarf accretion might work, um, how, how planetary material might accrete onto white dwarfs, um, and also why we should care about that. Um, so I think if, if we're being honest, I mean, I, I'm very intrinsically motivated as well to, to, to study the accretion process, because I think it's an intrinsically interesting problem. Um, but as a field, and, and from a broader perspective, most people really just care about white dwarf pollution. And just um, to, to, to illustrate how striking uh, data from this can be, um, you can start with an atmosphere and get these different uh, absorption lines. Um, skipping over a whole number of steps, you can get the abundances of these different elements, in this case, a whole range of different abundances. Um, you can plot these abundances um, in a diagram, and in, in this case we have uh, aluminium, titanium, calcium, but also, for instance, um, sodium. And you can look at these relative abundances um, in a statistical framework um, to get really clear results. So in this case, you have aluminium, titanium, and calcium being enhanced. And these are all very refractory elements. And we have sodium being very clearly depleted. And then if you interpret this in a statistical framework, in this case, one developed at Cambridge over the course of uh, seven years and two PhD students as a Bayesian framework, you get this posterior distribution, in this case, of the formation temperature, and it's really nicely constrained between 1,000 and 2,000 Kelvin. And this is the type of information that's just very difficult to get from other sources. At the same time, I think we should also be honest, and that in many cases, such statistical analysis shows very broad distributions, in which case you can't learn very much from, from those particular white words. Um, just recently, this year, we also had a, a publication in, in, in Nature, what well, Tim Cunningham published in Nature, um, uh, white dwarf repetition, not just measured from photospheric abundances, but also from the detection of X-rays. And so he, he, he detected four individual X-ray photons, um, corresponding to oxygen, iron, magnesium. And that amount of photons is actually consistent with what's inferred from, from photospheric pollution in terms of the accretion rate. So what, what are the constraints on, on, on white dwarf repetition? Well, we know that not all white dwarfs are polluted a significant fraction are. We just had some discussion on, on, on the actual rates. But it's between 30 and 50 percent, roughly. I think it's also important to recognize that that fraction is, is also a function on, on the sensitivity of, of observations, right? If you have infinitely sensitive detections of, of metal lines, then uh, that, that number would likely uh, go up. Um, so, so one thing that, that people do is that they look at the distribution of um, total mass contained in, in white forest with um, Helium-dominated atmospheres, which have long diffusion time scales. So the idea is that you're essentially averaging over accretion and can measure the total amount of, of mass accreted. And then you look at ongoing accretion rates from hydrogen-dominated atmospheres. Um, and taking information from the two together, you can derive or get a very rough estimate on the total accretion event lifetime of a single accretion event. And these estimates range from roughly 0.1 to 10 mega years uh, and are quite sensitive on, on the exact uh, diffusion time scales. So the, the point being that these accretion events likely last for, for quite a long time, individual accretion events. You also know that delivery is maintained for much longer, for, for, for giga years. So it's difficult to get a trend currently from, from hydrogen dominated atmospheres. But we have this trend from, from helium dominated atmospheres showing this decline of, of perhaps an order of magnitude over about seven giga years. Some of these white dwarfs show an infrared excess, corresponding to the presence of, of warm uh, dust. But perhaps the key point here is that most polluted white dwarfs do not. So about one in 10 polluted white dwarfs has such an infrared excess, and the others um, have invisible dust if it's there. And we also know that the distribution of these infrared excesses um, is a little bit more towards the, the cooler uh, white dwarfs as opposed to the, the, the polluted sample. And that the hottest white dwarf that's been found to have an infrared excess has a temperature of about 27,000 Kelvin, which coincides with the temperature at which uh, uh, minerals start sublimating at the edge of the Roche radius. And that, that, that's, I think, a significant clue to what's happening. You also know that, that these disks tend to be variable, but that it's the cool dust that's variable and not necessarily the hot dust. So Laura Rogers published uh, um, this paper on, on the near infrared. Um, and, and, and she showed that, that the variability is typically less than a few percent in the near infrared. But then Andrew Swan published in the mid infrared and showed that while there's not that much variability on very short time scales, after about a year, you start to see these variations 
of up to plus or minus 40% in variability. And just to reiterate, these are years. If the total accretion time scale is, is, is a million years, and variability happens on, on year-long time scales, that might be something that's quite difficult, difficult to, to reconcile. We also know that, that some white dwarfs uh, show transits. So this is a, sort of a, a nominal example of WD1145, which has transits with a period of about 4.5 hours. Um, other uh, uh, systems are also known that have, have transits, uh, but they, they, they don't typically have the, the same um, periodicity. And we have a talk about this, uh, this today. We know that some white dwarfs show gaseous emission lines, and these, these tend to be these double peak profiles that are not exactly uh, symmetric, uh, showing that there's some eccentricity in the system. And these two peaks oscillate, uh, again, showing that, that there's eccentricity and, and that they're uh, processing. Okay, so how, how can we explain all this information? T taking all of these sort of clues in the detective story, how can we, how we, can we try and put them together? What well, we think that what's happening here is that these white dwarfs are accreting material from an exoplanetary system, right? So perhaps the first step is to try and figure out what happens to the planets. We have, if you have a, a large planet, a gaseous planet, um, it can be uh, tightly circularized. Um, and so if, if you have a, a, a Jupiter mass planet that, that's quite close to the, to, the, to the star, then on the giant branch, it can circularize and be engulfed by the, by the star. But if it's beyond about four AU, uh, it expands its orbit as the star loses mass um, and survives. And then if you have a, a, a lower mass planet, uh, say an Earth mass planet, then it's not as susceptible to this tidal evolution, um, but it can still be engulfed during the AGV. Uh, and if it's sufficiently far away from the, from the star, it expands and, and survives. And so we end up with these remnant planetary systems on wider orbits where the Kirkwood gaps have also expanded because the, 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 the central star has lost mass, so the, the mass ratio has changed. Um, and so the, the, the next step would be trying to figure out how that material gets onto the white dwarf. I mean, you think that happens through gravitational uh, perturbations. So the key constraint to meet here is that accretion has to last a very long time, right? And so there, there's different scenarios. Uh, there, there's, there's a whole range of papers on, on different scenarios that, that try and get these accretion rates. Um, in, in, in the last year alone, uh, we, had, we had a couple of different papers on this, one from, from Lee that tries to evolve the, the solar system architecture. And he finds that um, the solar system would likely depopulate from the inside out, with scattering happening initially on, on the closer orbits and then the, the, the wider orbits. But that at least delivery from uh, the Kuiper belt could be maintained for, for, for 10 giga years. And then there, there's a study by, uh, by O'Connor, um, taking a, a planetesimal belt and then two outer planets, and again showing that secular chaos um, can, can, can result in delivery lasting uh, 10 giga years with a, a, a decline in, in accretion rate of about one order of magnitude, uh, which matches uh, the constraints as well. So now the, the stuff that I, I think is, is really interesting is, is what happens after a, 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 an object gets sufficiently close to the white dwarf um, that it tidally disrupts. And so the, the view on this was initially formed by, by papers from John Debbies and Dimitri Veras. And so what, what he did is he, he did simulations with quite small planetesimals on uh, quite tight orbits due to numerical constraints. And if you do those simulations, you, you form sort of spaghettified structures, very uh, narrow rings that are highly eccentric because the, the, these planetesimals come from quite wide orbits. We form these sort of spaghettified structures. If you take a, a much larger object like, um, um, like a planet, so this, this is simulations by Uri Malamut and, uh, and Peretz, um, you get a, a, a very different um, type of disk uh, uh, forming after the tidal disruption, because the energy difference between the, fra uh, the, the fragments is much greater. Right, so now half of the, 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 the planet gets ejected from the system, and the part that remains, a large portion becomes quite tightly bound to the white dwarf, but there's a whole range of different energies in different orbits. What's perhaps particularly interesting is that these orbits are set by the, the distance of a fragment to the white dwarf at the moment of tidal disruption. And so geometrically, if you think about a, a differentiated object that has a mantle and a core, the core is gonna be in the middle and the mantle is on the outside. Right? But so the, the fragments that are closest to the white dwarf are all mantle fragments at the moment of tidal disruption. The core in the middle and then 
the, the, the fragments that are furthest from the white dwarf at the moment of cellular disruption are also all Mansell fragments. Right? And so you form a disk where the core fragments tend to be clustered in the middle and the Mansell fragments tend to be clustered on the inside and the outside. And so it's an asymmetric profile. And now, if you have an accretion process that depends on the eccentricity of an orbit or the semi-major axis, and any accretion process is likely to depend on these variables, um, then you, you, you get an accretion over time where the, the ratio between the core and the mantle um, is not constant. And I think that that's quite interesting. So we call this uh, asynchronous accretion. Um, another part of this is that um, if you eject part of the, the uh, asteroid during the tidal disruption. Um, you initially eject the, the, the fragments that are furthest away from the white dwarf. And those are primarily mantle fragments. And so you get a bias in the ejection of mantle fragments and therefore a bias uh, in the accretion of core fragments. And so white dwarfs um, preferentially uh, accrete core relative to mantle and also relative to crust. And we, we actually see evidence of this um, in the white dwarf population. So after tidal disruption, what happens? I think that the first thing to figure out is, is what the size distribution should be for, for the fragments that survive the tidal disruption. So on the lower end of the size distribution, it's likely set by radiation pressure to about micron size objects. And then on the higher end of the size distribution, it's set by a, essentially a combination of the tidal force, self-gravity, and the inherent strength of, of, of fragments. So if an asteroid is scattered very close to the white dwarf, then you, you form very small fragments, right? it makes sense. If you, if, if, if you um, scatter an asteroid to sort of the edge of the Roche radius, then there's only just a balance between self-gravity and tidal force. And so having any little bit of sort of structural integrity means that a fragment survives. And so you get quite large fragments. So the question is, um, where, where do these uh, tidal disruptions happen? And so from analytical considerations, you would already expect that they typically happen at the edge of the Roche radius. And Dimitri Ferris published a paper on this showing that there's um, this clustering of, uh, of tidal disruptions happening very close to the Roche radius. And so the fragment, the largest fragments that survive a tidal disruption are likely to be uh, quite large on the order of kilometer size. So what happens to these fragments? Well, the, the canonical view has been for, for quite a while that these fragments just circularize and accrete through drag forces. But the problem there is that it doesn't work for large fragments. So PR drag, a pointing Robertson drag, uh, works up until roughly centimeter sized fragments. If you have a, a meter size or a kilometer size fragment, it just doesn't accrete in time uh, from, from PR drag. Uh, a potential solution to this is to have just much more vigorous drag through the presence of dust or, or gas, but then you, you need to have some reason why you expect there to be a whole bunch of dust and gas around. In fact, you, you, you need a similar amount of, of dust and gas to be around as the amount of mass that you're trying to accrete. And so that, that might be conceptually uh, difficult to argue for. It's also possible that magnetic fields increase um, the drag felt by, by, uh, by, by some of these, these objects, but then you need sufficiently strong magnetic fields, perhaps on the order of about 0.1 megagauss. Um, one solution to this is perhaps the Yarkovsky force the problem with the Yakovsky force is that it shuts off if you have too fast rotation, and so it's not clear whether uh, that can, can accrete these larger fragments. So perhaps the solution to this is to just move away from accreting these large fragments through drag and just um, turn them into small fragments so you, you can have collisional grind down. And the initial view on this was that the, these disks are likely um, uh, not uh, collisionally active, but that, that's probably wrong um, for the reason that, that there's a whole range of different orbits present in, some, in, in a post-tidal disruption disk. And so these orbits process at different rates, leading to, to high velocity uh, collisions between fragments and uh, collisional grind down. And so you could, can also get orbit crossings from, from other um, effects, such as the Yarkovsky force, which might may expand and contract some orbits, or from gas drag affecting fragments of different sizes differently. There's a whole bunch of reasons to expect that, that we will have collisions. And so simulations on this show that, that this collision of Rheintown uh, might complete in, in roughly uh, one mega year, uh, which does fit sort of the, uh, the constraints that we have. So, so, so can we align this with what we know about infrared access? Can we explain the, the infrared accesses through this, this general story? Well, perhaps we can. Um, so if you produce a lot of dust on highly eccentric orbits, then these dust grains have to circularize and accrete onto the white dwarf.
And if you know the circularization rate, for instance, through assuming that it's done by PR drag or some other drag force, um, then you know how, how much time a, a dust grain spends on a particular semi-major axis and eccentricity, and therefore you know how much infrared excess it, it emits during the accretion process. And so th this is on, uh, uh, assuming that it's an optically thin disk, um, but you find for reasonable accretion rates, uh, assuming drag by, by, by just PR drag, um, you, you, you find that you can match these infrared accesses. We also have to keep in mind that most, even most polluted white dwarfs do not show an infrared access. So you have to be able to simultaneously explain why some do have an access and others do not. And one potential solution to this is that perhaps gas drag is just a little bit more efficient around some stars uh, and, and, and less efficient around others. As if you have much more efficient drag then any particular dust grain just spends less time accreting onto the white dwarf, has less time to emit infrared photons, and you might not observe this. So that's one possibility. Then, of course, you, you, you need some distribution of, 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 of drag efficiency, for instance, through a distribution of the amount of dust or gas present around these white dwarfs. Um, it's not entirely clear yet whether uh, this collision of Grindtown is really dominant. It's also possible it's been suggested by, 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 by Lee, for instance, that, that um, the same planet that's responsible for perturbing an asteroid to get very close to the white dwarf um, could also be responsible for then scattering the fragments after tidal disruption, essentially skipping over uh, the collisional grind down phase and directly scattering them onto the, 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 the star. And for some architectures, that could also uh, proceed within about a, a mega year. So there's a, likely a competition between secondary scattering um, and collision or grind down happening. Um, if a white dwarf is sufficiently hot, um, ab above about 15,000 Kelvin, um, then the ice is contained in the white dwarf fragment or in the, in, in the asteroid or comet fragments um, will start to sublimate before um, the larger fragments grind down. And so if that happens, then you initially have a phase where all of the ices contained in the comet are accreting onto the white dwarf. And then in a second phase, all of the refractories are accreting onto the white dwarf. So then, just conceptually thinking about a comet of one composition accreting onto the white dwarf um, would yield different inferred compositions by looking at, at the photospheric spectrum if it's observed early and if it's observed late. And that, that's, I think, uh, quite interesting. Okay, so just to, 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 to summarize about uh, what we know about the field, uh, we know that many white dwarfs are polluted. It's a, a relatively large fraction of between 30 and, and 50 percent. We know that some of them have an infrared access, but it's only a small minority. We sometimes see these gaseous emission lines. We sometimes see uh, transits, and we have to try and explain this in, in a coherent uh, framework. So the dominant way of, of explaining this now is, is that uh, these are uh, planetesimals or asteroids being accreted by white dwarfs um, that are scattered by planets, tightly disrupt, phase collision or grind down or secondary scattering and then accrete either directly or via drag forces. Um, it's interesting that different components from a planetesimal can accrete in different proportions as a function of time. And we need to understand really the details of, of, of this accretion process if we want to uh, like get, get a handle on this. Right? And, and, and we really need to um, if we want to uh, interpret these photospheric abundances um, correctly. And we also have to be honest that we currently do not have a very precise view on the accretion process. Um, these transits, I think, are, are quite difficult to explain through um, this story of, of, of tidal disruptions happening on extremely eccentric orbits. Um, we do not currently have a, have a good view on the uh, gaseous emission lines, exactly um, how, how that geometry comes to be after tidal disruption. And so we, we, there, there's still a lot of work to be done trying to get this to a fully uh, consistent, uh, consistent picture. I mean, it's also a very young field, and most of the papers are published in the last couple of years. When I started my PhD, we really, I think, knew very little, and we know a lot more now, so that, that's sort of an, an, an optimistic way of viewing it. But there's also still a lot of work to be done. Thank you. Questions? Have you? Oh, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure if this is related, but uh, I've always been intrigued by Chris Manzer's paper about 
SDSS J1228 and the solid core fragment that's, uh, you know, like within the Roche radius. Um, is Does that fit into the story you're telling here? Or is there a story you can tell about how it has approximately circularized so close to that white dwarf? Yeah, so it's, it's difficult to explain how you can start with a tidal disruption and then circularize a fragment, keeping it intact. So in, in, the, in the work by, by Uri Malamud, where he looks at, at gas track, the problem is also that, that um, this gas track tends to happen at really high velocities. And so in the process of circularizing, you actually destroy the fragment. Um, and so one possibility is that instead of having a, a highly eccentric tidal disruption, perhaps you have some sort of tidal circularization happening during the scattering process. So as, as the eccentricity is increasing and increasing um, through scattering, um, it might also start to tidally circularize. Um, that's a process that has never been studied around white dwarfs, and I think that that's just now starting to be studied. That's one solution, um, one potential solution. But yeah, that, that, that's currently still an, an, an issue, I think, yeah. Other questions? I, I have one of my own. Uh, uh, we saw from C that we have different compositions for the accreting material. We have some that are more comet-like, more mercury-like. Does that tell us anything about the accretion mechanism, or is too many variables to, to, to say? Um, what it tells us about the accretion mechanism. Um, I think if, if we build up to a sufficiently large population that we can start to probe um, compositions or inferred compositions of pollutants as a function of, of white dwarf um, characteristics, and that, that will start to tell us something. Um, for instance, if, if you look at, at the, the accretion of um, volatile materials relative to uh, the refractory materials, um, the, the idea that, that perhaps components could accrete asynchronously um, would, would predict specific features. So, 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 so to be uh, precise here, so if you have a, a really hot white dwarf, you would either expect really um, high volatile levels or no volatile levels. And then for cooler white dwarfs, you would expect intermediate levels. So that, that's a, that, that, that will either be true or it will be false. And we, we can start mm -hmm. to prove that if we have a sufficiently large sample. And th there's other processes like that as well that, that will start to be able to probe with a large enough sample. Yeah. Will the upcoming surveys like Formos SCSS5 give us this kind of large sample, you think? Um, yeah, I mean, so, so I, I know that Laura Vogers ha has, has put in a proposal to try and study exactly uh, this, um, to try and expand the sample of, of, of uh, white dwarfs where we have oxygen measurements. Um, yeah, so it's... Uh, Bart? So in the collisional grind down model, what's the lifetime that, that you could sustain a, an elliptical orbit that would give these long period uh, transits that we see? Um, well, so, so I, I, I think most of the, the transits we've observed are on relatively short orbits, right? So there the, the implication is that you're no longer on a, a several um, AU orbit that, that, that might be suggested from um, um, this highly eccentric tidal disruption model where, where you're scattered by a planet. Um, so, so I think th those two are, are, are really quite distinct currently. There, there, there's not yet a self-consistent picture between this highly eccentric collision of Rheintown and these transits uh, that we see as was just um, mentioned previously. Um, but, but so the, the, the lifetimes of, of larger fragments um, in this collision grind time model really depend on the size of the, of the asteroid um, that, that's highly disrupts. So if you disrupt a really large asteroid, you produce a large number of fragments. Right? And so the, 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 the expected lifetime of a particular fragment uh, decreases with the size of the, of the uh, pollutants. Yeah. And also depends on semi-major axis. Uh, yeah. So it, can, it can vary from, from maybe 0 0.01 mega year to, to tens of mega years. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. How much mass, or like what fraction do you think will be ejected in those early stages? Um, I'm sure it's very dependent upon the, the conditions at play and maybe the type of planetesimal. Um, I, I, I think that that's relatively well constrained. Okay. Um, so if you have a really large object, then you um, eject exactly half. And so the reason is that, um, so, so, so prior to the tidal disruption, if, if you visualize the tidal disruption as being an instantaneous event, then prior to the tidal disruption, all the fragments contained in an asteroid move with the same velocity. So they have the same amount of kinetic energy. But then the potential energy 
is determined by their position relative to the white dwarf. Right? And so if you're exactly in the middle of the asteroid, you just continue on the same orbit. If you're facing the white dwarf, you continue on an, an inner orbit. And if you're away from the white dwarf, you, you continue on the wider orbit. So if you have an infinitely large object, then exactly half of the material is on a wider orbit, sufficiently wide to be ejected. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a function of, of size. So for, for really small objects, nothing gets ejected. And for really large objects, half get ejected. Other questions? I get to ask my second one then. Yeah. Uh, what kind of observational constraints would help you more? Is just increasing the sample or like more precise abundances or more uh, elements being determined? Yeah, so I think that there, there's a couple of different uncertainties. So, so one is that um, we have to constrain the uh, um, the accretion state. So, so accretion can either be in steady state, where, where the same amount is accreting onto the white dwarf as it's sinking down. It can be in a build-up state, where more material is currently accreting than is sinking down. So that, that's sort of an early phase of accretion. You can be in a phase of accretion where you've already accreted all of the mass, and now it's just slowly sinking down. And because different elements sink at different rates, whatever phase you're in actually matters for the implied composition. And so trying to um, uh, constrain the accretion phase is, is mainly a, a function of the number of elements that you have. So having more elements detected um, helps. Um, the second component is getting, so, so all of this depends on having good relative diffusion time scales. And so one thing that, that, that that's, I think, not mentioned enough is that we need better constraints on these diffusion time scales um, to, to, to get better constraints on the relative diffusion time scales. Um, yeah. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Mark again.